Hi everyone, welcome back to more English with Dry. Today we're going to be taking a look at improving our Macbeth essay writing. Specifically, we're going to look at how you can achieve a band 5. Now, in AQA English Literature, this is the band that goes from 21 to 25 out of 30. Obviously, getting a higher mark than that is something everyone should aim for. However, this video specifically is going to show you how you can improve and move specifically from that band 4 clear into this slightly better set of marks. We're going to be looking today specifically at a practice question that is all about Act 1, Scene 3 of Macbeth and focuses on Macbeth and Banquo hearing prophecies from the three witches. The question asks, starting with this section, explain whether or not the witches are to blame for Macbeth's death at the end of the play. Write about how Shakespeare presents the impact of the witches on Macbeth in this scene, and how Shakespeare presents the impact of the witches on Macbeth throughout the rest of the play. And now, as always, this is worth 34 marks. 30 marks for the actual quality of your argument and of your analytical skills, and then 4 marks for AO4 spelling, punctuation, and grammar. I'm going to take you through AO1, AO2, and AO3, show you some examples of answers that would achieve a reasonable mark, perhaps band 3 or even 4, and then show you how you can add things onto them so that the mark is much, much higher. This practice question is on the extract that is currently on your screen. I suggest you take a moment to pause the video and have a look at it yourself, thinking about which quotations you would choose to talk about in relation to this question, and also think about which moments from the rest of the play you would consider talking about to help you write a full Macbeth essay answering the question. So, these are some general essay writing targets. I've taken these from students that I teach, and they are examples of how you can very quickly make quite a big impact on the quality of your work, and of course improve those marks. Now, I've split them into advice based on which assessment objective they are. So looking at AO1 firstly, it's important that when using quotations or references to the text, you avoid retelling the story. The reason for this is that it gets in the way of analytical or evaluative comment. While it's hugely important that you do know the play very well and you're able to draw on several moments from it, you aren't just rehashing and summarizing the story for the examiner. Now, the reason for this is that it's not a particularly difficult skill. Once you've memorized a play, you could then write the, the plot out again indefinitely. Analysis and evaluation are the things that earn you marks at GCSE English, and so therefore that is what you need to do. Therefore my advice is, while using quotes and references is key, that you stick at that, simply references, rather than summing up whole sections of the play, because it just wastes your time. A1 again. Let's think about this question in particular. Macbeth is someone who believes the witches to the extent that he starts to take their prophecy seriously. However, what does it tell us about him that he believes them? The fact is, he calls them imperfect speakers. Now that shows that he knows that he shouldn't trust them, and yet he does anyway. In order to get a good mark for AO1, you need to make a strong argument, and that includes considering all sides of a topic. Therefore, when you think about this, think about what it's telling us specifically about him that he believes the witches quite so willingly. Furthermore, you need to analyze the intentions of the witches. Now, I know analysis is a word that's usually associated with AO2, but in order for making a good argument, you need to an analyze what the characters are doing as well. You need to do more than simply show that they are instruments of darkness, because you need to talk about why it is they might be like this. Always answer, asking the question, why, will get you a good AO1 mark. Moving on to AO2, language must be explored in depth in every paragraph you write. This should include, at the very least, picking out keywords and explaining and analysing their connotations. If you are not doing this, then you risk not achieving the full number of marks that you could for AO2. Secondly, in AO2, exploring irony in the phrase imperfect speakers. What does it tell us about Macbeth that even though he knows they're not trustworthy, he's fascinated by what they say? Now this links a little bit to what we were saying in the um, second AO1 bullet point, but equally it's something you have to do through the analysis of language. By calling them imperfect speakers, Shakespeare shows and at least an understanding in Macbeth that they are in some way going to try and mislead him. And this is something that you would need to reference in an essay, otherwise it would show that you're not thinking in enough depth about what you're saying. 
And finally, AO3. I've mentioned asking this question why all the time, and this is no more important than when you consider writing links in your paragraphs. Now, I suggest that you include the link at the end using a petal writing structure. Explain why Shakespeare writes the action in the play in the way he does. What is his message? If you don't do this, you don't show an awareness that the text is a construct created by someone with an intention and a purpose, then you will never get into the top bands. Oh, and AO4. The word intrigue, intrigued and intriguing is spelled like this. I include it only because a number of my own students have failed to spell this word correctly over the years. And it's one that will just make you look a little bit more sophisticated straight away. Okay, so here are some examples of work that, first of all, perhaps would achieve band 3, maybe up into band 4, 16, 17 out of 30, if they were carried out throughout an entire essay. Now, what I'm going to show you is how you can add to answers like these in order to lift your mark right up into the 20s, the mid-20s, even perhaps the high 20s, if you're lucky. So, looking at AO1. The sort of normal comment a student might make is, Macbeth knows that the witches can't be trusted, yet he still wants to hear more about what they have to say. This slowly starts to bring out his hidden ambition for taking the throne from King Duncan. Now, while this is absolutely accurate, and it absolutely begins to answer the question, it's not very detailed. It's quite shallow on information, and there is very little analysis of intention or very little analysis of writer's method. Indeed, it does not have an argument attached to it. So... As an addition, we could say, from this, the audience can infer that Macbeth's desire to transcend his prescribed role in life of a loyal soldier is extremely intense. He appears to ignore even his own instinct that the witches are supernatural tricksters whose sole purpose is to mislead good Christians from God's path. Therefore, while the witches seem to initially provoke Macbeth to explore his inner desire, it is too simplistic to blame them entirely for a characteristic that is clearly deeply ingrained in him. Take a moment to look at this ad addition and see if you can work out why it isn't shows an improvement. As you can see, what I've tried to do with this extra piece that's in yellow is link very much to contextual information and also show that there is a sense of argument that I'm making. I'm making an argument that the witches are not the sole reason for Macbeth's downfall, that actually his ambition is something that has taken root a long time ago. And that is what we can learn from this extract, rather than simply just making the comment that his ambition is there to begin with. Next we look at AO2. Here's another example of work that's around the band 3, band 4 area. As the witches begin to leave the battlefield, Macbeth demands, stay you imperfect speakers at them. This clearly demonstrates that he's intrigued by what they had to say and wishes to know more. It suggests that he knows they're untrustworthy, but still wants to know what they have to say. Again, I'm explaining a quote that I've used, and I am explaining it accurately. However, there is absolutely no analysis of this language. Now, analysis of language always must contain the form of in some way evaluating what a comment or a word means. It doesn't always have to be me saying that I found a simile or a metaphor, but it needs to be showing an awareness that the writer is getting across a message, and he's using a specific method to do that. So, there is a sense of irony in the fact that Macbeth recognises the inherent duplicitousness in the witches yet so firmly begins to dwell on their prophecies. The use of imperfect reinforces the fact that they speak in riddles, connecting with the oxymoronic fair is foul and foul is fair used in Act 1, Scene 1. Indeed, imperfect foreshadows the fact that, later in the play, they deliberately lull him into a false sense of security when predicting his apparent immortality. Again, take a brief look at this, see if you can work out how it's an improvement on just the work in white. So what should be abundantly clear is that there are at least two examples of technical uh, linguistic technique. Irony, oxymoron, etc. Foreshadowing even as well. But what these are doing is not simply acting as window dressing. They are actually meaningful pieces of analysis on words that the writer has used deliberately. Imperfect has multiple meanings. It suggests that perfection is near, but it suggests that it's not quite there, which is kind of like what Macbeth thinks of these witches. He thinks there is perfection that is just hovering out of reach and something that he can find. However, actually, it shows that they are not speaking accurately. In fact, it, what we should really say is that they're speaking incorrectly because they are not talking to him in terms of truth and reality. They are offering him vague and nice-sounding promises that may actually never come true. Indeed, 
what I've tried to do here actually is compare it to language they use earlier on, which would fulfill the second bullet point of any Macbeth essay of talking about the play as a whole. However, what I'm doing there is I'm using it to show that there is a sense of transition between how the witches talk then and then what happens to Macbeth as the play goes on. And then finally, the word, which I've zoomed in on, as you can see, which is always a very effective way of analysing in English, foreshadows later in the play this deliberate sense of false security they lull him into. As you can see, this is a far more detailed analysis of language than it was previously. Finally, we're going to take a look at AO3. This is the example work to begin with that would, again, hover around the band four. Therefore, Macbeth can be seen as a character whose ambition leads to his own downfall, rather than it being exclusively the witch's doing. It is his homartia, as it allows him to be tricked into murdering King Duncan by the forces of darkness and even his own wife. As an improvement, we could say the clear message behind Macbeth's ultimate punishment is that the Jacobean era was a time when personal aspiration and a desire to achieve a higher status in society than the one a person was born into was considered to be almost a sinful act. By giving in to the trickery of dark forces and allowing himself to be consumed by ambition, Macbeth challenges the very order imposed on creation by God. Shakespeare could either be criticising Macbeth for this transgression or simply portraying the obvious fact that it was not man's choice what rung of the great chain of being he occupied. One more time, take a quick look at this, pause the video, try to work out what I've done to improve this. Okay, so the first thing to notice here is that I have introduced some basic contextual information. The great chain of being, um, divine right of kings is hinted at here. Now these are obviously buzzwords. Now we know by now that AO3 is not just point... We know by now that AO3 is not just buzzwords. However, it is something much more important and meaningful. Context in AO3 is more about showing an awareness that the writer is producing a text, or in this case a play, in a specific time period with specific forces acting upon it. Macbeth was produced in a time period in which there was a king who had a particular desire for hunting witches up and down his country. Equally, it was a time period in which there was a king who was particularly concerned or worried that people may try and overthrow him and were starting to challenge his sovereignty. These are therefore inform the message behind Macbeth's ultimate punishment. They show that someone who gives in to the dark forces and someone who moves towards evil is someone who is likely to challenge the king. However, this is something that will always be punished. And this is the ultimate message to, of Macbeth. Of, don't worry, there are several. But it's that Macbeth will be someone who is punished for the by things that he has, chooses to do. He chooses to go against the, the prescribed order of God, and that therefore this is the reason why he ends up in this bloody, miserable way. I hope you found this video helpful. Make sure you stay tuned for more specific guidance on how you can improve your Macbeth essays. Take care.